Mark Pearson, Executive and Artistic Director of the College Light Opera Company, coming to you from the West Falmouth Library. Open now for curbside pickup. Welcome to Second Stage, a week in review of work being done by our talented orchestra members. Second Stage is made possible by a generous gift from Caroline and Jim Lloyd. Let's see what the High Field Philharmonic was up to this week. Hi. My name is Zach Minlopid, and I am the Associate Conductor for the 2020 Digital Clock Season. Our special guest for this week's Orchestra Masterclass was Chris Gurr. He's worked on such Broadway shows like Bandstand and The Prom, as well as putting out some content that you may have seen with internet personality and comedian Randy Rainbow. On this week's episode of Second Stage, we will feature even more of our supremely talented orchestra members playing your favorite musical theater and operetta excerpts. So let's start talking about click tracks and why we use them, I think. Um, there's everything from the far extreme, which I think Bandstand Tour falls under, which was we had, um, we took the entire Broadway orchestration and got rid of most of the players and only traveled with, what was it, four or five? Just five, yeah, the rhythm section. 
and then so we use click in almost every moment of the show to re pre-record um, the real musicians that's probably the most extreme example and i'll show you some of the click files from that in a second and then it just goes to the other end of the spectrum which is whether it's just keeping the tempo the same for a dance break or um you know just keeping yourself honest with the tempo as a conductor or anything like that and even you know using a metronome when you're practicing is a way of using a click um just to divide up time um, and then stuff in between click tracks can be used on broadway to synchronize with lights uh a dear van hansen they synchronize with the set moves um and and also you know with ableton you can add like in hamilton add on lots of different percussion tracks and all of these different things so there's a lot of different ways you can augment the music with clicks there's a lot of lazy clicks as well um, and we did this a lot with bandstand and this is sort of what I, the point i want to get across today is ways to use them musically instead of just looping something at the same tempo over and over again and I want to show you some ways to really make uh, clicks work for you in that they're not just a static tempo all the way through, um, that they actually change musically as you would um, when you're playing real music. Yeah, when I say a lazy click, it's just sort of when you set a metronome and let it go. But I think almost every musician knows instinctually that that's not really how music is played. There's ebbs and flows, you get more excited in a certain part and it goes a little bit faster. Um, you slow down slightly and it just goes back and forth. And I think clicks sort of become the enemy when you let them sort of dictate that and sort of flatten all the curves of music. So this is in logic and this is sort of where I work to make click tracks. Now also I'm gonna just break down what is here. So the, the process I did for the bandstand tour was to take the Sibelius file of the PV from Broadway and export it into MIDI. And so that is what all these grand piano staffs are here. Um, and, you know, you can do the same thing from Finale, whichever notation program you use, or you could just put the PDF in front of you and play it as well. And so this is just an export of all of the notes. And then this right here is the click. All it is, this is, I'm pulling up the MIDI right now. It's just one note and you, and you loop it forever. <laughs> Very boring. And then the way I did it for uh, bandstand is this right here. And if you're familiar with logic, you sort of have to pull it up with this button up here. I'm not going to go too much into how to do it in Logic because you know a lot of people use um, Pro Tools or GarageBand or other things, but um, I just wanted to show you some more of the philosophy of it. And what I did was sort of carve time out of it. So these are called these are tempo points. You can see this scale here, and so I just dropped in points. And wherever there was a slowdown, you can see the numbers go down a little bit um, and go up faster. And so the, temp the tempos are so variable. It goes, let's see, all the way from 201 beats per minute down to 143. And then I wanted to show you this one because we took it into rehearsal and these were more straight lines and it was more flat here and all these different places. And there are ways even to put, so you'll see this really deep trough right here is where the singer really wanted to take a breath. And so the, the only way we could figure out was to just put a deep dive in the tempo so that they would have time to breathe or have a moment. So I just want to point out, it's super helpful to keep yourself organized with markers of where the measure numbers are because then you can really easily communicate. You can also type little notes in here, um, you know, to each other if you're sending a file back and forth. And Pro Tools and 
lots of other programs have functionalities like that. Uh, we recorded down here, you'll see a demo of a person singing to it so we could follow where the lyrics were. Um, and this was all for a live situation, but now you know that we're all separated, it's a super useful way to keep everyone on the same tempo map. And you can still do it musically and align the MIDI to the grid, but the grid can be sort of crazy and nuts if you want it to be. So this is a really simple one. All it does is it goes, goes through and gets into a little bit and it just bumps up and that's it. So I actually sort of want to dive more deeply into this actually sort of more simple thing. Um, you'll notice, for instance, this, that this, even though it's probably in a shell, I just made it happen immediately. We could make, so I'll show you, you can make a curve so that it's not immediate like that. But the human brain, it doesn't, you sort of catch up to the click in a weird way. When you have an immediate change like that, the people who are playing along will probably actually be on top of the click about a bar or two in, especially when it's getting faster. And so sometimes you can do too much, especially at faster speeds. And then even if this was in a shell, I might just leave it as an immediate jump because the the effect of which for the real musicians is the click will jump underneath them at this bar and then they'll notice and by the time we get here they'll have caught up so people will be playing behind for a few seconds another thing that i'll do just another sort of random click tip if there's a sort of a shell into a tempo i often reach the new tempo a bar before it happens in the music because again people are not going to immediately like a computer play along um, they're going to catch up a bar later i wanted to show you one thing too which is very logic specific but it could be really useful especially if you're collaborating with someone from afar um, which is something i discovered after bandstand which just would have saved me a lot of time but oh well so that's how these things go which is um so what I, I just described, I would export the MIDI, put it into Logic, and then sort of carve the tempo by making these points and moving them. But there's another way to do it now, and especially anyone who even plays a little bit of piano, this can be simpler, but it has something called Show Smart Tempo Editor. And I'm pretty sure that um, Pro Tools has something similar. I'm not sure it's in GarageBand. Um, and what this does, so you could, instead of exporting MIDI, you could play something in. If I play the track and then send it to a music director, they will see all the measure markers and know, and they can see how the tempo fluctuates. And then the singer can give notes back and say, it should be a little bit faster there. And instead of spending that time to sort of try to find it in the MIDI or listen through, they can directly go to that point on the grid bump the dots up a few, and send it back to the singer in within less than a minute. We ended up discovering is that we could play along with their cast recordings or any recordings they had given us. Um, there was them singing on their phone or something like that. And uh, play along with that off of the grid and then click this smart tempo window. Again, it's you sort of right click on the region after you've played it in and say show hide smart tempo and you can analyze the tempo and what it does is it looks at the midi you can see down here and finds all of the places where it thinks a downbeat is and then you can apply this grid so it's under here under edit apply region tempo to project and then click enter and there you see it created sort of similar to who I was, the other song I showed you, all of these ups and downs here. And the cool thing about that is even if you don't play a lot of piano, you could just hit one note along with the recording that you want and just create sort of your own click, but it could find then pretty easily the downbeat to each bar. And then bam, you've created a grid uh, for the entire uh, song like that. I want to just talk about now 
you know, not to get too caught up in COVID stuff, just talk about using Click um, in live performance. So I know a lot of you are not uh, music directors, but you play different instruments. Uh, but I think it's more and more useful. And I just want to sort of underline the usefulness of knowing sort of how clicks work, why they're constructed the way they are. The more you know about sort of the tech elements of that, I've just found it so much easier to talk to the music director about how the music feels, even knowing your stuff about um, sound and just how sound works at a basic physical level. It's easier to talk to sound designers about how you're being mic'd and um, how your headphone setup is working. In a lot of pits, you have your own personal mixer um, and you have, you're plugged in and you have to decide what you hear um, in every situation. And just knowing a little bit about mixing and what is important to hear in each song can make you play a lot better. Being used to playing with the click is more and more important. And uh, I had trouble writing this down because it feels like philosophy. But whether you're playing behind the beat or ahead of the beat um, is something that's talked about a lot. That type of stuff happens all the time, especially when you're with live musicians. You can rely on the click too much, is I guess what you're trying to say. And you really still need to listen to either the track or the people around you and still play musically. Because the click isn't an excuse to just sort of let the click keep the beat. Um, you still have to know what other people are doing, how other people are treating the click, um, and it becomes very complicated. That's why I think practicing with the metronome a lot these days is actually a good idea and feeling what it's like to try to be really on top of the click or try to be ahead of it or try to be a relaxed around the click. It's, it's sort of freeing to be able to, you start to ignore the click when you get used to it and uh, sort of play around it. And you can sort of play musically without having to keep to the grid because you're still following other people and interacting with other people musically. Even if you're not a music director, everyone that you know, I've sort of worked with, especially rhythm section players, the more you know how to be part of the technical element of a Broadway show, the more useful you become as a player and a pit musician um, in terms of moving forward and being hired for things. You know, I know a lot of drummers who do their own click tracks for a show or they'll get paid a little extra to you know, describe all the tempos or put all of the clicks into one of those uh, pads that they use uh, to trigger them. And there's, you know, there's space for other types of instrumentalists too to know about synths and become just you know, another skill that makes you that much more useful. And more and more shows I've seen almost every uh, chair be asked to play maybe a little keyboard um, as part of their setup just to add some synth sounds. So I, um, you know, overall, the usefulness of knowing a little bit of, even just the tiniest bit about logic and main stage and how clicks are incorporated can really, you know, sort of boost your usefulness.
I have a question. Um, yes. How many dance breaks on Broadway would you say are clicked just by the nature of dance and dancers and, or is it more based on like the turntableiness of a set? Almost a hundred percent. Like most of them. And I, you know, we could have a debate about it. Some, so again, it's for many reasons, right? It's uh, dance breaks tends to be bigger. So there's often augmented music on there yeah. from Ableton, whether, you know, in Hamilton, it's a bunch of record scratches or whatever. Um, or it's just to sync with the set, like you say. Um, or it's lights, because there's often a lot of light accents. I often find that if there's none of those reasons, tech reasons, um, that uh, people still use it as a crutch because they don't want to get a note from the choreographer about the tempo being different. I personally think that's a little bit of a cop-out, but you know, a lot of people just do it to not get a note, which is fine. Um, but again, that is really when I would encourage that they sort of move back and forth and not just be you know, flat um, throughout and that the dance break either maybe gets a little bit faster with the excitement or you'll hear it in Hamilton if you use your phone to click along, which I do a lot more than I'd like to admit. Um, you can tell that when they go into a big, like fat halftime groove thing, they slow it down just a few clicks to make it feel more expansive. Um, so yeah, I would, but you know, they've done it right. But even, yeah, if you're using it in dance breaks still, try to think of it musically instead of just a way to, you know, not get a note. Cool. Thank you. But yeah, almost all of them, I would say. When was the, like, what project was the first time you found yourself making a click track? And a follow-up question to that is, um, what was the most frustrating thing that you had to get over when you first started making tracks? Ah, well, the first, it's interesting because the first thing I made clicks on, like for the full show, was actually probably um, Bandstand on Broadway. I was just the music assistant. I was doing all the Sibelius and Finale work and being like a PA for the music team. And then it just sort of became part of my job there. Um, so it was just sort of an add-on thing, which again, I think becomes an example of how useful that can be, you know, and it, I think it counts for every type of musician. If you're able to volunteer that skill and make yourself sort of more um, indispensable in that way, you're going to be an extra asset to whatever pit you're playing in. Um, and it's just an easy way to, because, you know, it's not, once you get the hang of it, it's not too hard to make a quick click track for someone. But for a lot of people, especially um, people who really don't like using computers, it can be a complete mystery. So it's it's really useful to just add that to your skill set. Um, most frustrating thing, let's see. I mean, it actually happens a lot where you'll find, like I found the analyze tempo thing um, during the Sondheim Thing. And I just had a, like a full moment of how many wasted hours I spent on bandstand doing it the wrong way. That happens all the time, but that's probably, yep. Yeah. And that happens with notation programs and everything too. You just, you know, figure out there was a better way all along, but you know, that's sort of the process. Can you talk about, I guess, the different camps of, of, uh, of, programs uh, as like a music assistant because when I interned on a show last year it was like the music supervisor and the and the composer were all doing everything in finale but then the um the copyist and all of their standard stuff was in Sibelius and so there was a lot of like cross program things and I've heard that like oh Broadway does more finale while West End does more Sibelius but that doesn't but that isn't always necessarily true it's usually based yeah. upon what the orchestrator uses uh, because that's the most complicated notational thing. So bandstands and Sibelius. I actually, my experience has been 50-50 in terms of Broadway stuff. So I would say, unfortunately, you have to know both 
<laughs> um, and I don't, I think it's mostly what people know first is what they, they use. Um, I think more prevalent actually is that people tend to use logic in terms of over Pro Tools or any other type of thing because most generally Broadway users are Mac users and so that just comes more naturally. Um, but you know, audio en engineers and if you go in and do an album or a professional demo, that's gonna be in Pro Tools. Um, but a lot of these things, if you learn one, you sort of learn a lot of the ideas and philosophies and you can jump to the other one pretty quickly. It's just a new bunch of keyboard shortcuts. Um, but, you know, I've been jumping over to Pro Tools a little bit more, trying to look at it. And, you know, a lot of the things are in the same physical locations um, because these programs are based off of things that used to be physical, you know, in the real world. You know, either they look like mixing boards or all these sorts of things. So there's a lot of common language. So, you know, just do whatever one comes first. I think Sibelius is easier to use personally and it's cheaper if you just want to buy it for a month or two and then cancel your subscription, so. Do you have any tips for subbing, especially like subconducting or playing keys? I, I mean, I think it's different for everyone and it's, it's something you need experience in for sure and it's really, really hard and it's the scariest thing ever. But I find the more I, prep, I think the two things are preparation, which is even like the first Broadway show I subbed on was The Prom. And because of the preview process that we had, the parts were a little bit of a mess and I was the second sub to go in. And so my prep involved, I photo re-photocopied the entire book and made the page turns that I wanted instead of the ones that were there and put a lot of notes in and so I was as comfortable as possible. And so there was a lot of prep that, again, sort of involved copy work and other things to make myself feel as comfortable. And then knowing the music back and forth, especially I find that if I'm, I'm not ready to sub until I'm not counting anymore, meaning I'm not counting the multimeter rests because I know exactly where I come in. I think if, that's my personal experience. If you like don't know the music well enough that you're still counting the bars until you come in, um, then it's not like internalized enough. The second stage is part of our larger series, Digital Clock. Digital Clock is made possible by a generous gift from Phil and Liz Gross. If you'd like to learn more about our programming or how you can become a supporter, visit us at collegelightoperacompany.com. Tune in next week for another episode of Second Stage.